Would you like me to go ahead and get started? Or are we still waiting on anyone else? Uh, we, we may have Matt, a few more join in, but feel free to go ahead. Yeah, Maggie okay. joined and I hit record. Does it show recording? It is recording. Mm -hmm. Okay, fantastic. I'll just give Maggie a second here to connect. And I'll continue uh, to monitor and see if anybody else pops up. Great. Um, in the meantime, hello, everybody. Um, again, thank you so much for joining us today. I will go ahead and just show you a couple things about accessibility just to refresh your memories. Um, I did share a, a full recording of accessibility training with John so he can send that out afterward so that you could delve into that a little more specifically. And then we'll talk just about a couple of resources I want to make sure you're aware of in the courses. Um, we can talk about you know, text and so forth. I also want to iterate um, before we even start anything is in that, you know, kind of like, like I did for you back in spring and sort of helping you kind of troubleshoot the whole final exams and prep. Um, my whole division is customer success and my team more specifically is called faculty advisors, but a colleague of mine, Bonnie and I work with the East Coast. Um, we're very, you know, we're very much there for you. So regardless of what textbooks, materials you pick, you know, you have some questions about features, that kind of thing. I just want to reassure you that we do have a team there to help you not just cover with training, but to help with maybe some course design, help you do some modeling of that, get that started for you, troubleshoot, find resources, whatever. So I definitely want to iterate that, you know, we are there for that process because we know both of us are educators as well. Um, you know, we certainly know from personal experience how much work is involved. And so, you know, we definitely want to be there to help, help you. So I'm going to go ahead and um, share my screen. Give it just a second here to pick that up. And you should see, oh, actually I can't, John, it's still stuck. You need to let me have screen sharing privileges. That's why it wasn't working. <clears throat> So I'll walk you through a couple key features with accessibility and just kind of show you some highlights. Are you able to get that to work? Ah, excellent. Okay, now I'm the host. I can do this. Great. So I'm not going to walk through every single slide here. I'll skip through a few things. As I indicated, I did share a more specific recording. I'm just using this since I had this ready to go. Um, Pearson has spent a lot of time money and effort into making sure that materials are accessible for you. Um, I work closely with the disabilities team for a variety of reasons, not just training, but also helping support schools that do have students that need special accommodations. Um, so we do spend a lot of time on this over the course of the last um, decade in particular, over the last couple of years, questions that may have been, you know, developed on flash that weren't compliant, weren't screen reader friendly have all been converted to HTML5. You know, almost all of the questions with rare exception in my lab math are compliant. You will still see some graphing questions that have been coded that are not. Um, typically you will find alternative questions and we do have some resources for you. Um, showing you even just how to pull questions from other courses to replace those as well. The disabilities team, just so you're aware, does review typically um, always JAWS, NVDA, which is a freebie that you can put on your own computer. That's what I use to test things myself. And they do also work with Read Write Gold, Kurzweil, um, VoiceOver, and some other technology. I don't always have access to that. One thing you can do just as a teacher tip, um, once or twice I have wanted to test something since I don't have JAWS, it's a very expensive proprietary software. You can download a free use of it for like 45 minutes. So it does actually give you the ability if you made your own questions, for example, or you wanna make sure something's working the way you thought it would from your PowerPoint, you can actually download and use JAWS just for a quick check, which is really nice. It's really useful. Obviously content, you know, uh, media content is captioned. There are audio scripts. More and more in our courses, you're gonna see accessible materials pulled out and kind of highlighted for you. Certainly if a student has a print disability, we have alternate format of e-text that's in your course, that's in every course now. You can actually pull that up to the, main, to the main tab. So there's just one click and the student's right in the book, but that's very helpful if they need to use JAWS. And there's more information and, and I can share this with John as well too, if you want this. We do have VPATs and I highly encourage you to even, you know, ask John or ask me about that if you'd like to have the latest copy. Um, the VPAT is actually the Voluntary Assessment of Accessibility. Um, that is a government 
form that we fill out and showing our level of conformance with current guidelines and standards, but that is fully disclosed, fully you know, accessible to faculty to use. We also do what are called accessibility conformance and remediation forms. And those are more specific by textbook and product. So for example, if you were using, I know you're using Triola now, and let's say you're considering using Sullivan text, you could say, I would really like to see, is there an ACCR for the Sullivan text? And it literally goes through every component of the course and highlights if there is risk or concern and what Pearson is doing to remediate that. And I'm just gonna skip past some of these other resources here. Um, hey, more specific, I'm sorry, go you, ahead. Before you move on, uh, I'll monitor the chat for you. Aaron Gray says, are the appendix table, um, i.e. critical T's, normal probabilities included with the accessible textbook? Um, you should, you can check in the back of the textbook, but a lot of times the tables and all of the materials that are in the text are all there. Um, they've all been, you know, conform, <clears throat> converted to a form that JAWS can read. If there is an issue with an alt text for that, it is, it is clearly identified there for you, but you should absolutely be able to scroll to the back of that um, HTML e-text and see the tables and charts. And that's a great question. Um, what's helpful with those is that those are static values. Those aren't changing. So it's easier to program those than it is, for example, to create your own custom question where values are changing and you have to code alt text with algorithmic variables. That's a little bit trickier. <clears throat> Excuse me. I just backed up a page when you asked that too, because I do want to emphasize that all the student pages, such as the calendar, homework, tests, assignments, that kind of stuff, results, the grade book, announcements, the study plan, those are all screen reader and keyboard accessible. However, students do need to turn on the accessibility mode to make that work. And I'll show you a screenshot with that. You can also make use of just common screen magnifiers on your laptop or desktop to work in my lab now. And there's more here about the, the e-text. <clears throat> One thing to note, again, in the newer versions of the courses, you're going to see accessible resources called out for faculty, which is really great time saver. It's really nice to have those. But you can also be using your own PowerPoints and things too. If you put an image in, now I apologize, I actually had an image here of a slide from a science presentation I was doing and I pulled it in. Clearly, we're probably not talking about the structure of the skeletal system in a stats class, but you can actually cl right click on the image in PowerPoint and it'll give you the option to edit the alt text so that you can type in what a screen reader would read to the student in lieu of seeing the picture. But again, a lot of that is provided for you already. Um, inside my lab itself, as you're building an assignment, the accessible questions all have this little icon. It kind of looks like a ring or a hearing aid symbol. You'll notice here, for example, 513 does not have that, so we would encourage you to be careful in using problems like that. You wanna minimize the use of questions that are not compliant. If you do need to find additional questions, of course, you can pull them from other books. There's even a way to filter that you're only looking at accessible questions when you're making a homework assignment. And again, all the media is accessible, which is really helpful. And more information about the media there. There's additional information on the help pages, accessibility, both for faculty and for students. So students can click in there and learn more about what's available and how to use it. And there are tips there for them if they do need to use the on-screen keyboard. This is a screenshot of what students would see. So you'll notice here, if you click the little gear icon in the top right, it says accessibility, and if you click that, you can turn it on. Um, you're only gonna wanna use that if you're using a screen reader or you're gonna navigate with a keyboard. Um, if you have that turned on, you don't have the math palette, you don't have an on-screen keyboard, and you only enter answers using command line language. So if students need to use that and you want to clarify anything with them in help, there's a online help link page there, if you will, that has all the keyboard shortcuts to add math symbols. And JAWS also has information for students about that. There's an entire student JAWS guide that walks them through what to do. Um, in many cases, students that 
hit the college level using JAWS are already familiar with some of the command line language, but it's still helpful to have that site since it's a little more specific to our product. Just a couple things as, again, as you're thinking about like building a new course and, and accessibility, the HTML book, as I said, is in there, the ebook, but it typically requires that you click, click a link, link to click to go get it. And there are ways to make it literally one click from the menu for the students right away, which definitely is much more user-friendly and it's really good universal design best practice. Um, also, again, use the screen reader compatible questions this is not going to apply to statistics, but if you're using a course with Skill Builder, you can actually check a box to filter out any non screen reader friendly questions for Skill Builder as well, not just the assignments that you were creating. But if you had, for example, if you were teaching an algebra course that did have Skill Builder, you could actually filter those out for the Skill Builder recommendations as well. And then, of course, use individual student settings. I love this that I can just go in the beginning of the semester find my student that needs accommodations for whatever purpose, extend the testing time for all the testing quizzes by 50% for the entire semester, once and done, save, finish. I don't need to do them one assignment at a time. So I'm just gonna pause again. I saw some uh, little flash that there might be a question, John. Yep, uh, from Aaron. Is the ability to add alt text on images being worked on in custom questions? Right now I have to insert it as an object and add alt text. You can add alt text. Um, so if you're doing if you're doing a graph or whatever, like if you're doing a Cartesian coordinate, there is a tab to add alt text there. It probably depends on what custom question tool you're doing. But if you do put, I mean, what type of question you're doing. But if you're doing, for example, a graph with a Cartesian coordinate, that kind of thing, there is already a tab there to enter alt text. Um, there have not been a whole lot of updates made to the custom question builder tool, with the exception of taking it off of Flash in October and putting it on a different Adobe platform. So that obviously you've probably already done the registry for that. That's a once and done process. But to my knowledge, there have not been other updates made to that tool. Typically, if faculty are looking for other resources, the first thing we do is look in other textbooks to find similar questions. And then if you do need to edit to start with Pearson questions and edit out parts that you may not want, and then, you know, the third choice, of course, would be to start from scratch. And that's where you do run into more of those issues with where do I put the alt text in. There are some additional resources here. And again, I can share this with John after. Um, if you end up with a student who is visually impaired, like I had a blind student in statistics a couple of years ago, um, he used a talking calculator. We also had raised graphing paper that he could use, which was really helpful for him when we were plotting scatter plots and so forth. They have other resources there. The prior page was just a general link, you know, kind of like, where do I start with all of this? Many faculty will say, you know, we're not trained as disabilities experts by any any stretch of the imagination, but we want to provide the best we can for our students. And so there's some really good information just to kind of get started if you're sort of at the beginner level with accessibility. There are additional resources here if you make your own videos, um, as well as things about sections 508 and 504, which are requirements about like web-based information, closed captioning and so forth. Again, technically, if you want your course to go through, you know, SACS accreditation, or if you were submitting it through Quality Matters, you would not have your own media loaded into the course or any external media, anybody's, if it's not compliant, if it doesn't have captioning and it doesn't have, you know, and or transcripts available, things like that. So many of us have videos that we've made for students, lecture materials, but they may not be compliant in the sense that there is no captioning or that the captioning is only at best 50% accurate like YouTube used to be kind of not the best. They've improved a lot with that, but we want to be really careful with what materials are loaded in our course. And this is just another one. Many, many websites from different universities. This is one from Iowa State. They had some great resources for their faculty. Coming back to Aaron's question, more specific information about the custom question builder. If you edit existing Pearson questions or you write your own, you're going to want to, again, add that alt text, only use caption media, even think about things like formatting of fonts. I know it seems really basic, but because we all have different kind of 
laptops and we're using different tools. Sometimes what looks big enough to us on the screen is not gonna display the same way for students. So it's always good to preview and see the student view and possibly modify the font. Um, and to be honest, if you're looking at creating questions with alt text, particularly complicated ones, it may be better to create static questions, meaning that they're not gonna have algorithmic values, but to make two or three versions of them and pool them together for variety or to use what we call synchronized lists. And what that does is if you have a complicated question, you are specifically saying, use these pairs of values so that you can very precisely control what the students will see. And that helps with creating alt text as well. And again, this is not the purpose of just going into a custom question builder training today, but that's certainly something that we can share more resources about and or answer specific questions. Of course, again, I've mentioned several times, just in case you don't know about pulling questions from other books to the right of the textbook you're using when you're creating an assignment, it says change. And so you can search by objective, you can search by title. So it's really helpful. If you need, for example, two sample <clears throat> hypothesis, uh, hypothesis testing with a t-test, you know, two sample t-tests, you can go in here and search by objective and pull up other books. And then when you click on the book title, it'll tell you exactly where to look. This was a different math example, as you can tell. But again, the fact that you can search by objective and textbook saves so much time. It used to be that you just had to kind of know where to look in the other book or you'd spend all the time trying to read the table of contents. <clears throat> now, uh, Diane, if I could jump in here for just a second. Actually, I'm gonna ask Aaron to help me out with this. There was an issue we ran into. Uh, I, I, don't, I can't remember if it was at the end of spring, but I actually thought it was at the beginning of this semester where, uh, we were trying to go in and we were trying to add questions, but it said we had reached our limit. Aaron, mm -hmm. you remember what I'm talking about, right? Was there, did we- So there's a limit of 20. There? There's a limit of 20 questions, Mark. Um, there's a workaround for that, but typically what happens is that you can, you can use up to 20 questions from whatever combination of other textbooks you want. When you reach 20, the system will give you that message. The only way that you can work around that is to literally save those other questions as custom and associate them with your textbook and, and you know, move them in that way, um, which means you're gonna lose learning aids. But if you really wanted those questions, that's the workaround. Yeah, Mark is also referring to how um, <clears throat> accounts will have limits on the number of custom mm -hmm. questions they can have. Uh, we ran into that a couple of times and there's something about the way that we are creating our, our coordinator course or copying mm -hmm. them somehow mm -hmm. that we get multiple copies of the same question. So it's filling that quota really quickly. And so when you go to look at custom questions, you'll see, you know, four versions of the same question. Yes. So that is a different type of, that's a different issue. Um, so that, Number one, you do have a cap in the account. We can change that cap. I can't personally, but somebody on the media team can. So we can raise it by a thousand or whatever. If that does happen, you need to let John know and he can shoot an email and we can get that fixed. What happens when you have copies, like when I copy, for example, one of your courses, all of your custom questions now sit, a copy of those sit in my account. So for example, because I've copied a lot of people's courses and tinkered around with things and worked on stuff, I had thousands and thousands of questions in my account, in addition to all the ones I've made. Um, and if you're importing from someone else's assignments, you're gonna get copies that way. If you've done multiple copies, like if you've copied the coordinator course and then some changes were made and the next semester you copied it, that's probably what's happening. You can go in and choose to archive. Um, you can organize, you can delete duplicates if they're not being used, however, you still have that cap. If you archive, they still count towards that, you know, the 1000 cap or whatever it is, but we can change that. I do agree that that system's a little bit clunky for lack of a better word, but that's just how they have it set up. Um, it's only a subset of the overall programming tools and there's some constraints with how they did it. And they haven't changed that in years. I've had to have my cap raised several times, like I said, because I work in so many different courses and copy things. Yeah, and if you just shoot me an email like Aaron, and I think you and Mark both did this, it, it's normally the same day that they just ra raise the, the limit. So it's it's not a problem. Yep, as long as the, the two or three people that do that are not out of office. So like if you tried to contact us over Christmas break, there might be a delay, but otherwise 
over the holidays. Other than that, you should be fine. And usually is the same day as John said. Does that help? Yes, that was um, that was exactly what was happening. We had an ad, an adjunct. She used to be full time. Cindy, you may know Cindy McNabb, may not. I don't know. She played a, a major role in the uh, construction and the, the the creating of the O five thirty course. A lot of custom questions went into it. Mm -hmm. So all those custom questions that she did on top of the things that she was copying, mm -hmm. she ran, she ran into that limit. And mm -hmm. I think uh, we shot any. I'm pretty sure we got that extended. That cap number was just bumped up, so it was. It, it just it, when it happens, we we know how to fix it now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, unfortunately, there's no way to avoid that. Just like there's really no way to avoid the, la the limit of 20 questions in an assignment, but we just have workarounds for it. You know, we raise the cap, we import questions. <clears throat> but very good points there. I have another question. I have heard uh, from some other softwares like this that sometimes you can use Excel to create uh, variable tables and then import them in for your custom questions, uh, preserving some of those formulas. Is that something that is possible with, with this or something being looked at? To my knowledge, I have, I mean, I've never been able to do that with a custom question builder tool the way it is right now. And like I said, there hasn't been any changes to it. Moving forward down the road, the plan is to make it a different form of it eventually. But I say eventually, meaning it might be a couple years out for that. That would be really nice. Um, I completely agree. It's it's same with like learning catalytics. If you've ever used that clicker tool, you know, kind of that, that tool you can do work in LaTeX and then copy it into learning catalytics. But oftentimes if someone's not using LaTeX or if they've already spent all this time typing out a really complicated formula, what I usually say then is just take a, take a screenshot and upload the image, like don't reinvent the wheel. So here, unfortunately, I've never had any success with that. I have tinkered with rules and formulas in, in Excel just to get it working the way I wanted and then kind of use that as my, as my, you know, kind of template, if you will. But Unfortunately, again, it's the subset of our coding system. And so they kind of want you to manually type it in. You can't paste it. You can, the one thing you can do is potentially like sometimes what I've done, if like I'm saying, if I've got a more involved, I know some of them I was working on recently were pre-calculus. And so I had some formulas and you could copy part of the formula into and then reformat it. So that saved me a little bit of time, kind of like I'd already worked out the, the, the kinks in the formula. But unfortunately, the algorithmic values have to kind of be edited one at a time. But that's a great question. And I will pass the feedback on to them. I'm sure they'll love to hear me say it again. But it, it reinforces the fact that people do ask. Because we have a, you know, statistically, there's a small percentage of faculty who use this tool. But then many of them who do use it, use it really well, you know, and they're making a lot of use of it. And so they do have those requests for features. So we keep asking anything to make it less time consuming because it's so tedious. Absolutely. <clears throat> so taking a look here at accessibility, and again, I've sent a recording. Um, this particular course ID actually has kind of compiled resources across math courses. So if you are looking for additional, typically graphing related kind of questions, you can click and open an assignment and list the IDs and you can kind of see where the questions came from. So it helps you sort of fine tune what books, what sections, where to look for things. But again, inside that course, if you will, there are also resources like the current VPAT, um, information about doing alt text, how to customize your menu and put the ebook link directly there, that kind of stuff. So again, just a resource for you. Now, just give me a second going to probably, I'm probably going to have to re-log back in here. So go ahead and think for a minute. Do we have any questions? Well, oh yes, it's going to make me re-log in. I just wanted to pull up a, a textbook here. John, any questions while this is refreshing for me? I had one uh, just kind of on a personal thing. Okay. It happened last week. I was trying to copy the coordinator from, that we were currently, you know, we were in to go ahead and create one for spring. And I was having issues and I following the steps like I've done for years, 
And when I would create, copy the, the course, make it instructor use only. And then once it's created, then I would go in and switch that one and turn it into a coordinator. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, not allowing me, and I, and I tried it at least, created at least three different ones. It would not, when I would go in to switch, when you go to edit details, it wouldn't give me that drop down to switch it to a coordinator course. It just said, learn about the different courses. And it had a link, but it wouldn't let me make that switch. I was wondering, and, and I'd, I'd, I've emailed, let's see, I think I've been in contact with two or three different people are you just saying, well, we're going to send this up to the next level, up to the next level? I never have heard back what's going on with that. So when you copied it, I'm sure you were very careful to make sure you were not making a member copy, but you were actually making a standalone copy, correct? Correct. Instructor okay. use only. Okay. Um, I have a suspicion about what might be happening, but if you can get either directly email or send it to John, he can forward it. If you can give me the course ID that you're trying to copy and the copy that you try and you made, like in other words, the original, the coordinator, and then your course, let me do a little bit of sleuthing on that. Okay. I'm not gonna hypothesize what happened until I take a look, but I, I think I know. We've had that happen with a couple other, I mean, sometimes it is that somebody copied it as a member and didn't catch it. That's easy to fix, just delete and do a new one. But there are sometimes issues with course groups and copies and I'll take a look at that for you. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So one thing I wanted, a couple other things I wanted to draw your attention to, um, and this is one of the, another book that you might be interested in. We'll talk about this in a little bit, but first I want to draw your attention to a couple of resources that are pretty much available in most of your stats courses. One is that most of them have, if you're looking at new options, you're going to see like a guided notebook, a student study guide, um, a learning guide, depending on who the author is, they call it something different. And we've had a lot of really great feedback from faculty about those and students as well. We've done a little bit of uh, research with that and um, the, the efficacy of making use of those too, which has been positive. So those are always something you might wanna check out. Now this is, a, this is the, uh, you can actually, you have choices here, a PDF or Word. I'm just gonna kind of show you the Word document here for data collection. <clears throat> the reason I'm showing Word is a lot of times faculty want to cop to modify this. So it's easy to go in here and modify and then share with your students what you want them to see. Different authors, of course, set this up differently. So you can see there's there's even a link here if they're watching this, you know, if they're doing this on their computer, they can literally click right here and watch the video and then, you know, write some definitions in their in their printed paper or on their laptop, whatever it is. Everyone has a different format here. This particular course in Sullivan also has activity workbooks, which is really nice. So if you're looking for some really good ideas for class activities or even things you can assign students to look at online, explore ideas, um, this kind of walks them through some of the applets that he's created and ask them questions, you know, to kind of click and explore. And again, every author has their own version of comparable tools. Things that are specific to all statistics courses that you'll see across the board. And again, you've probably explored these. I just wanna call your attention to these because over time updates have rolled out. And as you're looking and exploring, it's helpful to see this. Number one, in the tools for success in a statistics course, you're going to see typically links to applets. You're going to see some graphing calculators, um, guides to technology. You're going to see links to stat talk videos if you've never explored those those are by andrew vickers he's a biostatistician for memorial sloan cancer center in new york and he literally goes out literally on the streets of brooklyn and talks to people about statistical ideas and and uses everyday life examples um he has a great accent that's what my students say they love listening to it i'm like hey whatever it takes to get you to do your stats. So those have questions that you can directly assign in homework as well, and I'll show you that in a little bit. Of course, links to data set, links to stat crunch, tutorial videos, study cards. These are great resource, regardless of what tools you're using. There's a little study card in here that shows students just some resources and things to follow through and use. So again, that's kind of standard across your stats. Um, courses, you have tools for success, um, you have your guided study notebooks, you know, your learning guide, whatever you want to call it. Notice here, I wanted to draw your attention, they do have, this is the accessible resource page, your newer courses are showing this. 
So you can see video transcripts, you can see the workbook as Word documents, you have activity manual, additional information. Um, some courses have accessible PowerPoints. It just depends. It varies slightly by author team, but you'll see some really neat resources. And then of course, under instructor resources, they'll call out new assignments, um, additional materials. This particular one has classroom lecture notes, a stat talk instructor guide. So if you wanted to use those, just some tips for that, all sorts of things here, resources. Um, by the way, this is an aside, but we, we do have a new partnership with Gradescope. So that's another tool that you can use to have students show work. And there's information here about that. Um, the online test bank, if you need to pull questions from that to use directly in LMS. Again, trying to make things be more easily located by you so you're not spending as much time going, okay, I know it exists. I don't know where it is. I don't know where to go or I have to click and log in three other places to get it. We're trying to make this a little bit more of a one-stop shop. In assignments, okay, so we're just gonna, oops, sorry. This is what happens when I click too quickly and there's a lot on the menu. <clears throat> in assignments, when you're creating assignments in a statistics course, you have access to a lot of resources. And again, you can see a little pop up there about grade scope coming up there. Um, we're just going to take a look at a demo stats homework to see what's available. So of course, as you're building a homework assignment, you do have media available. Let's go into summarizing data in chapter three. So we do have media available that you can assign, and this can include animations and videos and examples and technology help and so forth. But under here itself, Within the chapter, you always want to take a look at what's available. So let's just talk about dispersion for a minute. So if you look here, you'll see that you have a lot of reading assessment questions, um, kind of getting students to explore the concepts. So those are useful. On your drop down menu, you also have conceptual question libraries for statistics. And so these you search by topic. So obviously here, Topic three is numerically summarizing data. And again, you could drill down here and look for dispersion. And again, you could find questions that kind of get at the gist of students really understand not just how to plug and chug, but also what these results really mean. And you can embed these in your homework as well. You also have other things hidden on this menu. If you scroll to the bottom, you have the stat talk video assessment questions. So what's nice with these is once you've chosen which video you'd like your students to see, for example, a video about variation, then you can actually assign a question that has the video directly embedded. Students watch it and then they answer a question. So it's kind of tricky for them to answer these correctly without watching the video. So you're kind of guiding them in the direction of making use of that resource. And again, these are cross courses, it doesn't matter what textbook you choose, you have access to those. You also have access to, and I'm not sure if you've seen this here, there's a stat crunch project option or stat crunch topics. So you can come in here and literally assign a topical question, let's say restaurants, chains, so it links to the data set. It gives students the background, and then it asks them to click on the data set and then answer a question. There are also questions here you'll notice that are showing up with this little kind of paper pencil icon. That means it's an essay question and you would be grading those. You're asking students to type a response. Um, obviously you don't wanna do a ton of these for any particular assignment, but I really like these. These are really helpful in making my students think and explain their reasoning, not just kind of mindlessly plugging in things or trying to paste it in. But here it says create a histogram and then take a look at those and then which graph do you think best just depicts the data. So they want a histogram, a stem and leaf plot, a box plot, a dot plot. And then after you're looking at those, which graph do you think does the best job of explaining this and why? And then you can respond to your students' questions and their responses, excuse me, and grade accordingly. So again, you can search by topic, you can search by, by a more of a kind of broader project. Um, 
again, also just as a side note, we do have mindset materials. These are in all of our math courses and stat courses as well. But I really find these powerful tools to put into my orientation in the first week or two of assignments, um, regardless of what course they're in. So those are also available too. There are a lot of neat and um, creative new resources available. One of the things then that Pearson has done, um, we have two authors. Um, you might have met or heard one of them at a conference or seen some other materials they've done, but Mike Sullivan, he does have some standalone statistics books materials like fundamentals of statistics with data and so forth, but he collaborated with George Woodbury another professor and author, and they've created this course, which is an interactive statistics course. And so what this has done is literally created, and I'm going to kind of take you here to this view, um, again, a very specific student learning path where students first read the material and interact with it in very small chunks. So they read a little, they watch a little video, they take a little bit of an assessment, they continue through. And when they finish interacting with the material, then they work on a section homework and they assess what they do and don't know. Basically what they've done is created a truly mobile kind of learning experience, which is what many faculty have been doing kind of manually over time trying to break down the material, create a very specific learning path for students. They've done that kind of already here. So you could start off with a pretty well-developed interactive course and then edit it as you needed to. You might see, for example, that there's a section that's omitted from students and that's because they've chosen for now to keep that hidden unless you wanted to have it available. Um, this was just a sample that I did for somebody. So you could say, I don't want students to see this probably do. So all you would need to do is unhide that from students. At the end of the chapter, there's a review, there are additional exercises and even answers to those for students. But let's take a look at what this looks like here. This might be new to you. And again, I would encourage you to just go in, adopt a new course, look for interactive statistics and take some time to explore it. Nope, I guess it would help if I would have actually set the dates to be available. So okay. guys, while Dan's doing this, I, I wanted to point out you know, coming into this presentation, we weren't really sure, I guess, what type of text you were looking for. Like if you were somewhat happy with the approach of Triola, or if you wanted to look at kind of a new approach along the lines of the interactive statistics with Sullivan and Woodbury. And the reason that Diane's kind of showing you different things is A, accessibility and the ease of being able to transition to a new course are key, but B, everyone in TBR kind of uses something different. And that's kind of why we wanted to show this to you. You guys use Triola, Walter State right down the road uses Sullivan, but they use Sullivan standalone book. Roan State, your sister school uses Sullivan, but they use the interactive statistics. Pellissippi uses the Larson text. Mm -hmm. Chattanooga State uses Sullivan. So it's, everybody's a little bit different. So we just, you know, obviously you have access to all of these inside my lab, but I didn't know kind of what you want to Diane to really look at with this. So we, we, we just wanted to show you whatever you wanted. One, one of the things that oh, I know that always comes up when we're talking about, <clears throat> uh, you know, the, the online homework system is what those question helps, uh, which we're very familiar with, you know, help me solve this view an example. Um, they're always, I don't know if it's specific to the book that we're using, but it's always geared towards formula-based explanation on that and would really, really like to see more of a technology explanation. Like if it's a normal distribution question, instead of showing Z-score formula, look this up in a Z-table, which some instructors do want to do. Others would like the flexibility to be able for a student to hit that question help and get, say, here's what you need, the, the function you need to use on a calculator, here's this, how it's input and things like that. So there's definitely technology help available. Um, you can choose to have some of those displayed for students as available links. Um, you can also, as you well know, you can hide some learning aids, even at the question level or at the assignment level and input your own documents, tips, instructor resources and so forth. So there are definitely some workarounds for that, but there's definitely technology material that you can do some off, some instructors choose to assign, for example, a video that walks students through how to use StatCrunch, for example, to construct a confidence interval. 
as part of the assignment. And then there's also a document in there that they could print out and have as a reference tool showing them the steps. So there are resources like that available. Again, they vary by text, they vary by design, but there is definitely a lot of emphasis in the last you know, couple of years in particular to really developing a rich repertoire of technology resources for students so that they're not spending so much time trying to figure out how to use the technology, but how to interpret the results from the technology instead. Um, I can show you some of those in a minute. I do want to show you here. I don't know why it didn't load earlier. I didn't have a due date on it, but this is one of the reading assignment kind of interactive assignment overviews. So you can see just looking here, it would show objectives and it would show what the question was. Notice that these are locked because I have to work through things. So I have to continue to look at this from the student view. I need to work through. Um, I might, here's a question that I had partially correct and partially incorrect. I still, I do have learning aids in here. Um, so here's tech help, for example. And if I click here on tech help, it can show me the different, this one actually just links to a generic list of technology resources, depending upon which one you would be using. Um, you could also modify that and have it go directly to a specific video for that assignment. Like I said, most instructors do that. But you can see here, the student reviews the content. So in this particular case, it's really basic. Um, they do a reading assessment. They check their work. What's the sample in the study? Um, I'm just going to put something in there. Okay. Uh, let's see. I can do my final check. Oh, good guess, right? I haven't really read my homework. So now I can do similar question, or I can continue through to, you know, click to another objective, read through that, and then answer the questions. And so I'll see my progress up here as I'm working, I can see the objectives clearly delineated for me. And of course, when I'm done with whatever portion of the assignment that I can work on right now, I can click save. And I can easily click through here. This is really nice, by the way, on an iPad um, or on, you know, even on a phone. I've tried this on my phone. You'll notice here when they are looking at examples, there are video solutions for different technology. So here's StatCrunch, TI-84, things like that. Um, technology step-by-step. -step. So again, I can click in here and say, okay, I'm using StatCrunch. My teacher wants me to do that. What do I do? So it tells me what steps to follow, but I can also click here and see a video solution. So I don't know that you could hear the, the audio, for example, but you can see, you can hear this is actually George this time walking students through the use of this tool and how to read the output and what it looks like. Hey, Diane, you got a question that popped up mm -hmm. uh, from Aaron. Another thing we are interested in is inclusion of more co-rec, pre-rec skills material that may be tech specific, but perhaps you can give us an idea of good text to look at for that. Absolutely. That was next on my list of things to cover. Again, we're getting a survey today, but um, let me close out the interactive and go back here to the menu. So number one, all of your textbooks have... Um, a little bit, and I, you know, I say a little bit, meaning, you know, there's some review material and co-requisite material. So let me just show you this here. Again, if we were going back in and we wanted to create an assignment, we wanted to put some review in, we can just look at what this looks like. So if I click in here, you'll notice that there's a getting ready for statistics. Now, this is a very small um, kind of grouping of material that you'll find in your different stats courses, operations, expressions, graphing, linear equations, solving equations, that sort of stuff. You can certainly pull questions from other algebra books and so forth, but it's much easier to have books that actually have all of that material deliberately preloaded. And we have quite a few statistics books. And again, I'm just going to pause here for a second while I'm clicking through and loading a course here. Um, we have quite a few statistics books that are labeled integrated review, um, which is basically designed to contain co-rec material. Some of them also will have a title now that'll say something about co-requisites to kind of help you draw your attention to that. So give me just a minute here. It's a little slower loading when I'm on Zoom. But I'm trying yeah, we're, to kind of... we're looking at, it looks like your wheel is stuck halfway through loading. Right I paused it for a second and I'm, I'm, I'm refreshing the page. But that's, yeah, it's, it is, it's because of Zoom. Then for some reason, sometimes this is really slow. No, I, I do the same thing. Whenever I'm sharing my screen or on Zoom, it, uh, everything goes a lot more slow. 
So I'm just going to search, but go ahead. If there's a question or anything right now, I'm just refreshing the page and I'm going to pull up a show you one that has integrated review. Um, as John mentioned, you know, books by Sullivan, Larson, Triola, they all have options with review material. Um, again, very, very helpful to help build those courses. Uh, let's see if we can pull one up here. Oh, let me see. Actually, let me show something else here. I'm gonna go to... And Diane, if you, if you can multitask, I can read another question while you work. Yep, go ahead. From Aaron. Um, I feel like I'm Aaron's spokesperson today. Hi, Aaron. Uh, <laughs> um, another thing we are interested in is inclusion. No, that's the old question. Oh, sorry. Can you tell us more about grade scope? We typically supplement our MyLab material with instructor worksheets in which students write answers on paper slash upload pictures. Absolutely. So first of all, let me back up and talk to you about the, re the statistics material with integrated review. And then I will talk to you about grade scope. What I'm going to do is actually just show you one of the, um, I'm on the, hang on. I went to Pearson Higher Ed rather than jumping through courses in there because it's kind of slower in my lab math. So here I am in the catalog, but I just want to show you what's available. This is probably faster than trying to click in and out of five different my lab math courses, which is what I was going to do. So you can see here, for example, that there's an elementary statistics picturing the world with integrated review. There's one integrated review from Sullivan. There's one from Larson. Here's a different version of the same book. So you have those reviews. Let me show you what this looks like. Um, if we click on to table of contents, so you'll notice here that there'll be an IR, um, both Sullivan and Larson kind of have a integrated review before the chapter starts. So for example, there's one about reading graphs, understanding notation, working with percentages, addition, subtraction of integers, um, significant digits, rounding, working with decimals. You can see some of the topics that are included. So these can all be assigned in addition to or embedded in or as separate assignments. Um, you can use these however you want. Many of the integrated review courses do come with pre-built skills check and a little homework to practice. It's personalized, but sometimes just because of the sheer number of assignments, when faculty and I are talking, I'll say, you know what, instead of having all this separately, you can weave some of these right into your existing assignments as well. So it just doesn't look so overwhelming to students, it's really up to you how you wanna make use of that material, but you can see that there's a specific set of resources that you know Mike in this case has chosen to go along. This is not just generic developmental math material, this is specific to statistics. And then he even pulls out for you here, if you notice which section it would be most applicable for if you choose to directly put those right into an assignment. So again, you can scroll through. Um, you will find that not every single chapter has integrated review material. It's much more focused on the beginning of the textbook, obviously. And then as you go through the text, you'll see that there's less and less of that. Like for normal probability distributions, this particular one just kind of reviews how to work with square roots. And sometimes they have a little bit with formulas, working with a number line when you're dealing with confidence intervals. And as you get to later in the book, you don't see too much. Of course, you have slope intercept form before you do correlation and regression. But I really like how this is laid out because it's really calling out exactly where the students would need those skills. And again, completely usable in any, any particular format that you'd like to do, whether you wanna have separate skills checks and reviews or you wanna weave them right into assignments. So any questions with that before I talk about grade scope? Yeah, Aaron and Mark, are, is that kind of what you're looking for? Something with an integrated review aspect? We think probably so. Yeah. And the, the benefit with these is you don't have to pull it from another book. Like you don't have to go and pull these questions from other materials. They're already here. They've already been kind of curated. So whether you're using, you know, whether you decide to stay with Triola, um, you know, Sullivan, Larson, whatever, they're already available, which is really nice. In a perfect and, world, we would have something with lots of integrated review and a focus on using the TI calculator to solve the problems. Mm -hmm. That would be ideal. These courses, and, you're going to see, you definitely will see the technology things like I showed you about TI 83, 84. Um, they do have the technology videos. They do have the technology guides on the Tools for Success page. 
Um, they also have stuff that you can assign as media. Sorry, John, I didn't mean to talk at the same time. No, it's fine. Jan Lewinchuk uh, also piped in and said, which books are better for calculator helps actually integrating the calculator helps in the problem? Um, you're going to see the tech. I don't know that one's better than another here. You're going to see these newer ones all have the technology resources. So it's really, I mean, honestly, I think part of it would come down to whose writing style or the type of questions or application questions that you really like. Because the features that I've been showing you are available in the different courses, you know, whether you, whether you went with Sullivan or Larson or Triola or one of the other statistics books that aren't as, <clears throat> excuse me, heavily used, you're still going to see the technology tools, the media, all those resources. So it's really more of what layout and content you really like. I know, I know, um, I haven't been to my office in, well, since what, March, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> but just a few times. But I know I had a book from years ago that was, I think, I'm pretty sure it was a Triola, uh, you know, a, a, very much like what we had, but it, it, the book itself had like TI-83 was part of the title of the book. Yes. It was specific to, the, I didn't know if they were still doing things like that or, or certain authors were, or if that's something. Mm. So I, I was, Marty Triola still does have one from the copyright is last year. It is an elementary statistics using the TI-8384. And so the examples in the text and the, the particular focus, certainly it's workable with any tool, but the examples are heavily focused on the TI and that's kind of what's called out and, and delineated as opposed to being more kind of generic and then having just little synopses of all the different technology tools. Yep, he's the only author that really, really, really kind of focuses on doing that. Uh, most of the books across the board, if you remove this one from the mix, if you just look at, at Marty Triola's standard elementary book, elementary stats, and then Larson and Sullivan, they all have the same resources, the technology guides, the links, the videos. Um, there isn't typically this plan to kind of call it out for a particular technology tool. I don't know if that's going to continue moving forward or not, to be honest. I would have to ask the content team. Um, again, these resources are sort of across the board in all of the courses, so they may be eventually phasing out having multiple versions of the same textbook. Hey, Diane, um, if, if Northeast State decided that they liked that Marty Triola book about TI-83, what would be the realistic logistics of of a transition for fall from, you guys are using the fifth edition, is that correct, of Triola? I believe. So moving from that to the TI-8384 book, I mean, it's gonna be the same authorial team. I mean, it's- Yes, it, it'd be the same, yep. The question should pretty much map over because it's fifth edition. So the only thing that you might see some content change would be some additional media resources being available on this one versus the other one. But it's the same textbook, it's the same content. Um, there'll just be some additional material specifically focused on the TI-83. You should not have a lot of issues with mapping imports because it's already the same edition. Um, if, you're, if you were using elementary statistics, there's a 13th edition, that might be what you're thinking about. There's a sixth edition of Excel, yeah, then it's a fifth edition of the TI-8384, so. That's my so, fault, that's what they're okay. using. Okay, because yeah. I was like, the 13th. Yes. yeah, yeah. Sorry so what'll that. happen, what'll happen is a lot of this will map, not every single question will, there's been a few that have been replaced or updated, but um, that threw me for a minute, I'm going, well, that's weird, but that should map, um, but yeah, so you're, if you're in the 13th, which people have done, and you go to here, you're going to have a little bit of um, change, like if you click here and you look at the content, there's very, very little difference, hang on, let me just click here. Um, you'll see here very quickly as an overview, you'll see your data sets, your chapters, things look very similar. Um, most of your questions would map over. There'll be some updates that are specifically focused on the TI-83, but you should not have a huge issue. The one thing that would need to be potentially redone would be media um, in your assignments, because typically when you go to a new book, even if it's not necessarily a new edition, it's kind of the side-by-side -side edition. It just doesn't always import media. So that you may need to update those, but you might want to do that anyway, knowing that there's a lot of new stuff available. So that might be, that would be one thing that you would need to do pretty much regardless of what textbook you went to. But you can see 
the content really hasn't changed between the 13th or the 5th. Um, he does not update, like he doesn't roll out as many updates or versions, if you will, of the Excel or TI-83 books. And that's why, that's why that this is only at fifth edition because these are only periodically rolled out. Whereas the other one was on kind of like an every three year update. But Moving forward too, we're gonna be doing digital updates, um, which means more behind the scene and less instructors having to start from scratch with new courses. So that'll help. John, I'm sorry. You know, and I was just trying to think uh, the, the integrated review aspect of other books, could that be pulled in somehow? You can manually rebuild that. You can't import it per se, um, unless it's Triola material for another book. Um, you could, you know, you can import an assignment or something from his book, but if you wanted to rebuild and we've done that, um, you know, and that's where I said that table of contents I showed you is really helpful because if you have that, I've literally sat here and had that printed out and gone, okay, I need to build some integrated review. Where can I pull from Sullivan's book into Triola's course or whatever course I'm building? And that's how we do it. And that's how other faculty would do it with for their own. Um, I do want to talk about grade scope, but I also want to be cognizant of the fact, I think we scheduled an hour and we're almost at that marker. What's best? I mean, I can follow up with a quick video showing you grade scope. I can talk to you briefly about it. Um, I do want to allow time for questions too, but unfortunately I've got another meeting coming up. I do have about 15 minutes yet, but I also don't want to rush anybody's thought process. So any, yeah, any videos or anything that you could pass along tutorials or just kind of an explanation of of grade scope. I know Aaron was the one that uh, I think originally posed that question uh, and he can jump, he's jumping back on here. So um, it, I, I know we, we, we had an hour schedule. We could always reschedule and talk and I, Diane, I'm personally going to be in contact with you to see, figure out what's going on with this mm -hmm. um, copying of new course, which I've never mm -hmm. had an issue with until just now. 2020. Like I, yeah, like I said, yeah. sometimes there's just a weird, um, there's just a weird thing with that. I'm going to actually paste a video right into chat for everybody about the grade scope tool. I'm going to explain briefly what it is. Um, and and, and I, I did see a question. I did see the okay. other question about Respondus. Okay. Um, so the Respondus, the answer is we're working on those partnerships. I'm not going to tell you a specific date yet, but you will see some updates fairly soon. Um, it's on the roadmap, um, especially with the pandemic you know, Pearson, like all the other companies were like, wow, we really need to try to make this work for people. So they, they have been working on trying to get a closer, cleaner working relationship with Respondus. Right now, if someone wants to use Respondus in their LMS, they have to upload our test banks and test that way. And the goal is of course, to be able to test directly in my lab math inside your LMS or my lab stats inside your LMS and use Respondus. So yes, there are updates coming, stay tuned. It's on the very not too distant future roadmap, but I'm not putting any dates out there just in case something changes. Aaron, um, did you put a thumb up emoji on your screen? I did. Wow. <laughs> we really I'm, want to be able to use Respondus, so that made me very happy. I'm super yeah. impressed with your technology, technology skills, to be honest. Yeah, there aren't a whole lot of little emoticons on Zoom, but they're fun to use when you can get that hand clap or that thumbs up. So I promise you that you will be really excited with it. I know that they they ran into some logistics with the tools because, you know, Respondus functions a certain way, our tools operate a certain way, LMS, all of that. So there's so many different layers of integration, if you will, to look at, but it's looking very positive. This is grade scope, just very briefly, let me give you the nuts and bolts about this. What this is, is that it allows you to deliver a homework if you wanted or a test or quiz in here, which is what most people use it for. And so students can take, do their work on here. They get all their work gets uploaded. They have to upload their work. And then you can come in, use a rubric to grade export the grades back to my lab. Now, right now, it's a little bit more manual. In spring, and we're targeting mid-March, it might be a little sooner, you will actually be able to create a grade scope assignment from the assignment manager like you would grade a homework quiz or test. It would then send you over to grade scope to develop and choose material, 
come back into your assignment and set your assignment settings. There'll be some differences in how it operates from a MyLab assignment, but it'll be a little more seamless. For right now, and I shared the video, for right now, you can actually create an assignment in grade scope. For example, a test that you want to give. You, you said you like to do some paper pencil you know, work. Um, and then export, you come in here and grade and you export those grades back to the MyLab gradebook. And that's what that video shows you. I know we don't have a lot of time today. So what I'm going to do is draw your attention to, if you just go to grade scope and you click on the help center, you can actually search here just about anything. Um, they have a great resource here. How do I get started moving my assessments online? Um, you know, how do I how do I assess online? How do I get an assignment started? There's how to work with FAQs, you know, tips for students. There's a whole pile of articles here and videos, lots of resources available. I would encourage you to check some of these out. So this one in particular, like how do I create a quote course in grade scope? Um, and then how do I add students to my grade scope? How do I edit an assignment? It's pretty straightforward. I'm gonna be honest. I literally, when we first were working with this partnership and I was making, I made the script for that video. Um, I literally didn't look at any of their stuff and just kind of came in and played around. I'm like, oh, okay, this isn't too bad. Um, was able to figure it out with not a whole lot of, you know, time invested into it. Not a lot of issues with logistics. It's pretty straightforward. You can, like I said, export the grades back to my lab and import them, which is nice. And then come mid spring at that point, you'll be able to directly work from my lab, come over here, go back to my lab, set assignment settings and so forth. But this is very, very well done in here. They have a lot of information, literally who can create a, who can create a course? How do I do it? You know, how do I set up a course roster? How do I give students access for right now? If you wanted to try it out, even just for just for fun, I would go ahead and say to do that because they were giving people access just because of the pandemic. And then moving forward, you have access because it's a Pearson partnership. Um, but again, I would just encourage you to explore their help articles. They're very well done. There's a lot of information in here as to how to create a course, upload assignments. Um, if you email them, if there's like grade scope related things, you can reach right out to their help, help desk there, email them and ask for help. You're not going to look at linking because if you linked it with Gradescope, then you can't link your LMS with your MyLab. You don't want to do that right now. But um, add students and staff. And then, of course, like I said, I sent you the video on how to work specifically with exporting grades. You can actually upload questions very easily to Gradescope, whether you've already created like a test gen test or you have some word questions you want to upload. It's really easy to do. Um, so that's what I did. I just created, I had questions already created. I uploaded them to, to Gradescope. Students do work in there. They show their work. I go through and you create a rubric to grade and then you can export the results. Diane, uh, Aaron said, many of our instructors are also, or excuse me, are using uploads to the LMS or Shobi for written assignments. It would be great for students to only have one place to go for all things. Yep. So I would definitely encourage you to check out the Gradescope partnership and see if this is something you might want to use. Um, like I said, you know, at this point, it's still separate, like students would still have to click and work in here, for example, for a quiz or a test or whatever you wanted to deliver. But by the middle of spring semester, hopefully that final, the final link with my lab will be in place. And that will be working. And I'm saying mid March, they're hoping for sooner, but we're kind of saying mid March to be safe because I'd much rather have them test it thoroughly and not have a problem when people start to use it. So we're currently on target for that. And guys, just I know in, in the effort, or excuse me, in the interest of time, does everyone who needs to talk to Diane have Diane's email address? I'm sure Diane. It's John Johnston at Pearson.com. <laughs> you know, excuse me, it's John dot Johnston at Pearson.com. I know. Yeah, I know. But I was, <laughs> we, we I am know Diane. the John Johnston one pretty well. Yeah, I am Diane's receptionist is basically what I am. So it's <laughs> No, 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 it's not. No, you're welcome to email me. Um, yeah, and send things to John too. He can always filter too. Um, if you have specific questions, I, you know, like I said, again, I do apologize that I had another meeting, but um, we can always follow up with additional materials as you're digging and looking and deciding on a text. Um, 
particular features, you have questions about whatever. And then, like I said, grade scope, if you watch the little video I shared, come in here, take a look at things. It's pretty, pretty self-explanatory. I think most of the time we haven't had a lot of complaints about it not working or things not integrating or it doesn't make sense. So I've been pretty pleased so far, at least with a lot of experience and feedback I've, I've received. Yeah, and guys, if you do feel the need to have a, a supplemental meeting, you know, maybe whenever in a week or two or even further, whenever you guys have had more time to dig into materials, just let us know. I mean, we'll we'll set up a time. I mean, it's, I know time is always of the essence. So, um, but if you feel like that would be beneficial, just let us know. We, we do thank you, John and Diane, um, for, for coming in and joining us today. Um, you know, we're always going to be in contact. We, when issues come up, we know to who, who to reach out to, and you guys usually do a, you do a very good job, John, especially getting a quick response back. So uh, we, we do appreciate that, and uh, the, the wanting to work with us. You know, trying to if, if, if you know I, sometimes we ask for things that that can't be done, but we can. It seems like you guys can usually come up with a way to if not exactly what we want, get close to it. So we do appreciate well, that. We appreciate your partnership and would love to continue that in the future. So whatever we can do to help you and your students is what we wanna do. Absolutely, I'll second that. And as I stated before, um, you know, my team is here to help. So if it's not myself, it'd be my colleague, Bonnie. Both of us have taught tons of stats. You know, we know the books, we know what's, we know the MyLab, we're here to help. Um, I did put one more link into the chat for all of you about Gradescope. This is their getting started page and you'll see that there are lots of resources here about even doing annotation when you grade and how to have students upload things and scan exams and all sorts of just really helpful links there. There's a lot of videos in here that walk over resources. So again, their, their site's pretty well developed. They've been really responsive when people have questions and you know, maybe that'll be something that'll really work out for you too. And I, I, I chose to save this recording to the cloud. So once I find out how to get it, I will send it. You need to log into your Zoom account, John, and then download it and then convert it to an MP4. Thank you. Thank you. It, well, actually, it'll be an MP4. If you open up the Zoom folder, you'll have an MP4 option. And then usually what I do is that I then put that onto YouTube as an unlisted link so that anybody at the school has access, but no one else would. I That's the easiest way to share that, because it because so I will let Diane do that. <laughs> well, you'll have to, I don't have access to your cloud, but you can download the, if you download it and share it with me via um, SharePoint, then I can convert it and I'll put it on YouTube and share you back a link. I can do that for you. Yeah. We've all had to learn how to do that in the last few months out here. <laughs> yep. Yep. I do it all the time. It's like my YouTube's pretty busy. <laughs> Any other last questions? We have a couple of minutes here. Any other questions I can help you with right now? And again, I'm, let me reiterate what John said. If things come up later, you can always email too. If you're like me, typically it's like, ah, oh, shoot, I should have asked that, you know, and he comes to you later that day, so. Any other thoughts? I did share, um, as I stated, the accessibility of recording specifically focused on that. I shared a couple of other videos that he can send out with you as well. And like he said, if you need other stuff, you just need to let us know. Yeah, we're happy to help. Okay, guys. Well, thank you so okay. much. And we will get you that link soon, okay? Hey, sounds great. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everybody. It was nice to see Good you. To see stay you stay safe and warm, and hopefully you don't get snow. <laughs> <laughs> we're supposed to get 55 this afternoon. I don't know if it got that warm yet, but we're supposed to be getting 50-mile-an-hour winds and heavy rain. So they already sent us an alert, like, be prepared. You're probably going to lose power. And I'm like, great. So Wonderful. Yeah. Well, I'm glad we had power to enjoy your wisdom this afternoon. <laughs> yes, I'm glad I'm not trying to run a Zoom off my phone. That doesn't work very well when you have Zoom after Zoom and your phone battery is dying. Mm -hmm. Well, have a great day, everybody. Thank you so much Thanks, for your guys. time today. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.